Okay, so we're, we're recording now, so a couple of more people joining as well. So I suppose just a couple of other housekeeping things, just in terms of everybody's on mute at the moment, and uh, I'd ask you to stay on mute if at all possible. Um, and if you have questions that you can, you can send them via the chat function that's at the bottom of your screen. And um, I suppose the first thing to, to, to say is I'm, I'm going to share a presentation with you now, and I'll, I'll just load that up if that's okay. Um, which is here, and, and just just I suppose to give you a little bit of a little bit of background, uh, like tonight's meeting, I suppose it's part of the Tennis Ireland uh, services that we are offering to clubs. I suppose as part of our as part of our strategic plan, um, and I suppose we we've six themes in our strategic plan. Building the base, um, optimizing coaching, supporting the tennis community, transforming competitions, uh, branding, identity, and commercialization, and maximizing emerging talent and performance. And and uh, I suppose this workshop and I suppose the resulting information and supports that we provide to the clubs is part of our building the base function and our uh, supporting the tennis community function. So that just gives a little bit of I suppose the context in terms of in terms of uh, where we are in terms of our strategy. So um, hopefully you'll all be able to see the slides there now. I think. Roger, you can see that there, can you? Yeah, yeah. Great stuff, great stuff. So as I said, you're very welcome. And uh, I suppose what I'd just like to do to start off is just talk a little bit about 2020. Look, obviously it's been a really tough year with many with many challenges, many, many challenges. None of you would think that I was only 24 years of age. I've lost all my hair and I'm getting to look a bit older after this after this year. But uh, look, I'd really like to thank the clubs and their members for, for their support throughout the year. And uh, I suppose what we've tried to do is we've tried to engage on your behalf, you know, whether that's getting our sport back playing, trying to, you know, put a bit of pressure on, on government to allow us to uh, reduce the protocols in particular areas. We've had some successes along the way, we've had some rebuttals a little bit as well. And uh, I suppose we've also lobbied hard for funding support and you know, not just ourselves, but all the sports have, have been working closely and there's, there's quite a collegiate approach to, uh, uh, I suppose, to the work that we've been doing and, and trying to lobby government to put in place funding support. And I think, uh, you know, having the sports capital program uh, this year, I think will go a long way on top of resilience funding and other funding supports that have been there, whether it's through local sports partnerships uh, or, or other supports. And I think what we try to do as well is we've, we've endeavoured to engage with you, um, whether that's around the development and dissemination of the guidelines around COVID, whether that's around, you know, obviously assistance with running the competitions. We developed, uh, I suppose, a framework for running competitions and we supported a lot of clubs and guided them in relation to running the limited amount of competitions that we could have this year. We also developed some guidelines around running safe camps. Uh, obviously, we were engaging with you around funding notifications, etc. And, and I suppose then on top of that, we've, we've, wherever we have been able to do it, we've tried to deliver as normal a range of programs and activities as, as possible, uh, you know, whether that's parks tennis, whether that was in terms of our performance uh, uh, squads at provincial level, uh, all those different areas we've been, we've been um, uh, trying to, to work on throughout the uh, uh, throughout 2020. And I suppose in terms of, sorry, I'm after freezing here now. Sorry, yeah. I suppose really what what I suppose the, the theme for this year has been really we're in this together. Uh, I think you know, compared to a lot of sports, we've probably had a, uh, you know, we, we've probably had, if you, if you can say it, a good COVID. Um, uh, I think uh, the, the uh, even though we have had some challenges, um, I think membership has, has generally risen. And I think that's been good. And I think that's one of the benefits of it. And I think even doing doing meetings like this over Zoom has, has, has proved to be beneficial as well. Um, Roger, you might let Suzanne Fox in there if you don't mind. I think she's she's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I let her in. perfect. And uh, so I suppose in terms of 2021, look, it's a, an exciting year ahead. You know, obviously there are still a lot of uncertainties that are there, but we've got a lot of big projects coming up, uh, which were which are just coming to fruition now. And, and, and I suppose the last sort of eight nine months has given us a little bit of headspace to, to get stuck into these uh, and get them ready to go. Uh, we've been working very closely with the ITF on the World Tennis Number, which is a, a new rating system that will be coming into uh, uh, coming into Ireland uh, very shortly in, in the next in the next uh, um, number of weeks. And that'll be a really exciting development for us. Uh, we have our Equal Advantage strategy, which is going to be launched very shortly. So we we appointed Grain O'Neill earlier earlier this year to uh, I suppose to to look at our sport particularly in terms of diversity uh, and to try and encourage more women to get involved in leadership roles and coaching roles etc we're pretty much 50 50 in terms of playing wise but there are some challenges around leadership and I suppose uh, representation of women on branches and boards and and uh, and, and in other areas and, and that's going to be a big focus for us um, over over the coming months we've got our club spark platform as well so for those of you who don't know 
Club Spark is a is a, a club management system which we are uh, we managed to get some funding from Sports Ireland for, and we are uh, going to be rolling out over over the next period. So uh, we're going to be piloting that in a couple of clubs uh, over the next over the next number of weeks, and uh, we'll be rolling it out countrywide over 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 2021 and beyond. Uh, obviously, we've just published our tournament calendar and uh, events and, and they're all on our on the tennis ireland website so we can see what uh, tournaments we'll hopefully be able to play in uh, this year and then obviously then we we have uh, our usual range of new or, or programs some new programs and, and some updated programs which we'll be rolling out during the year and we will continue to engage with with our member clubs and i suppose one of the one of the most one of the one of the probably most important things from your point of view i suppose really would be uh, that we would expect during 2021 that the sports capital funding will be will be announced um, for those of you as well who, um, just in terms of, um, you, you may, some of you may have gotten this already, but we have developed a, a toolkit and we call it the Tennis Ireland Facilities Toolkit. And I'll just log out of this and I'll log into it for a second and I'll just give you a little, uh, a little preview of it. And um, uh, I will send a copy of it to everybody afterwards. I have, I have everybody's email address and I will send it out. But um, uh, Raj, can you still see that screen there or do I have to? Yeah, yeah you can. Okay. So. So basically what we have is uh, the Tennis Ireland Facilities Toolkit. Now this is a really useful toolkit, I think, for clubs who are looking at developing facilities. So that's why I felt it was relevant uh, for, this evening's, um, for this evening's workshop. So uh, basically it's an Excel, it's an Excel spreadsheet and, and uh, I suppose it's an interactive tool that's been, that's been developed by us and uh, allows the users to explore different facility investments relevant for tennis clubs, whether that's court surfaces, floodlights, court covers, um, you know, gives you dimensions of courts, etc., fencing systems, um, and and uh, a little bit about accessibility for people with disabilities. And we also have a facilities calculator as well. It's a really good, useful tool if you haven't seen it before. And I'll just run through it very quickly. So if I want to click on, say, say for example, uh, court covers, for example, so indoor courts. So what we get is we get a we have some. Yes. We're only seeing the presentation, not the Excel. Ah, excuse me. Sorry. Well, thanks for telling me that. Now I'll I'll. Uh, let me stop sharing and then what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll load it up again. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, here we go. Uh, it should be coming up there now. Hopefully that will work. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So you see, as I said, it's a it's a it's a it's a very um, user friendly you know, click and play uh, uh, spreadsheet that's there. So as I said, if we were looking at court covers, you just click on click on the court cover section and it just gives you some information around it in terms of double, you know, cost for a double skin, uh, a double skin air haul or a, or a, um, a frame fabric, which is a bit like the, uh, the Shank Hill uh, tennis club or the DCU um, um, court coverings. And if you, you know, if you just scroll down, you'll just see the different, the different, uh, Type. So if I want to go into, a, say, an air hall, so which is the, the air domes, just gives you some detailed information about the design features, you know, sizes, all that different type of thing. So just some considerations around the construction and the membrane and how it could be financed, etc. Uh, so if I wanted to go into, say, for example, court surfaces, um, just click on click that, click on that, and it gives you some information around, just some general information around new court costs in terms of if you're looking at four courts. You know, the, the red here is artificial. You've got the ash, asphalt. You've got artificial grass or um, the acrylic acrylic surfaces. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll just see some further information and you can get more detailed information. For example, if you take artificial grass, uh, it gives you some of the performance characteristics of artificial grass, the pros and cons of it. And then I suppose a little bit of a, a cross section and then uh, some other bits and pieces around in terms of the cost of renovations. If you're doing a low, low, medium or high, high level renovation, just some costs around it. A little bit about maintenance, etc. Same then, obviously for um, let me see, clay, artificial clay courts as well. So some really good, useful information uh, that that uh, clubs can use as a guide, I suppose, in terms of the different types of courts, and gives you some gives you some generic information around that. One of the other things I suppose that we've done as well is we've developed a, a facilities calculator, and uh, I suppose what you can do is you click on you can click on the uh, you can click on these things. So if I'm looking at building, say, new New tennis courts, and I want thinking of. I've just been. I've just won the lottery, and I'm, I'm looking at building six new tennis courts, artificial clay. Do I want an indoor structure? Sure, I might as well while I'm at it. So I'll go for the. We we'll go for the big one, the the, the frame fabric, uh, and I want new LEDs. 
uh, do I need fencing? No, I don't need fencing because I'm indoors, so I'll just put in no, um, and, and that's fine. And then what it'll do is it'll give me uh, typical it won't work there now, but it'll, it'll give me a it, it'll give me a, a figure there. So 1.477 million, as you can see. So uh, it's too big a number, too big a number to go on. But but uh, so you get the idea of what we've what we've done. It's a really useful. Uh, tool that you can use in terms of in terms of just getting some simple access, and we'll email that out to uh, we'll email that out to everybody afterwards. And look, it's it's the kind of thing you can play with over Christmas. All right, so it's our our little Christmas present uh, to you. So so I'm going to move on from that. Uh, I'm just going to stop sharing that, and then I'm going to move on to a uh, and just back to the presentation that we had, and we can get uh, stuck into what the I suppose the main event of tonight, which is. The sports capital program uh current slide uh that should work now can you hopefully you'll be able to see all that there now um so sports capital and equipment program as it's now known uh for 2020 so basically a little bit about the sports capital program it's the largest provider of funding uh for sports related capital projects and equipment um from a tennis point of view, uh, it was over 1.9 million in funding in, 20, in the 2018 program, which is the last one. So that, that funding came in uh, at the end of 20, 2018, early 2019. Uh, we did get another, I think it was around 400 and nearly 500,000 from, from, uh, from the large scale sports infrastructure program for a facility down in Thurles that we're looking at in conjunction with the Limerick Institute of Technology. So, so we did pretty well in that. Um, but it's over 5.6 million euros in funding provided to 103 tennis projects in the last in the last two rounds, which is which is which is very good to be quite honest with you. And certainly for a sport of our size, we got the fourth largest allocation of all sports in, in 2018 after GAA soccer, golf, and we were we were a close fourth, I suppose, to golf. Uh, and, and actually ended up getting a little bit more than, than rugby got. And uh, uh, so it's so you know so we did pretty well on that and and I think uh, you know there's just so, a couple of examples of some of the facilities that have been developed over the last while so you'll see uh, Galway their air dome um, their air dome that they put in Lansdowne in new tennis courts Rushbrook new courts as well uh, you have Temple Oak with their air dome and you have Sutton with new floodlights and that so so you can see some of the some of the projects uh, that have been developed and look it's not all it's not all big clubs uh, it's like some of those some of those clubs are big clubs but we've also got a lot of smaller clubs. Uh, rural clubs and uh, uh, who have who've also received some significant support as well. We were lucky enough in a number of counties where we actually got the highest allocations uh, out of all the sports in, in a number of counties. I think uh, Waterford, I know St. Anne's Tennis Club uh, got the highest allocation, and I know there's a there's a couple of others as well that were certainly if they weren't first, they were they were second or third in their county. So so we've we've done well and we've punched above our weight in that uh, for the last couple of years. And, and I suppose part of that is, I suppose, the engagement that we've had with clubs around the workshops and a little bit about the, uh, you know, some of the tips that people have picked up along the way. And also that level of engagement that we have done on behalf of clubs, but also uh, also how we've engaged with the clubs uh, and helped them to engage with, with politicians, etc. And that's, I think, something that we need to uh, we need to keep doing to keep our sport relevant and to keep our sport in the mind's eye of the decision makers, which are which are ultimately the politicians and, and the ministers. So the objectives of the programme uh, look very very simple to assist voluntary community organizations, national governing bodies, local authorities and schools to develop high quality, safe, well-designed and sustainable facilities in, in, lo in appropriate locations. Uh, they prioritize the needs of disadvantaged areas and communities in the provision of sports facilities, even though they do prioritize disadvantaged areas, disadvantaged areas and sometimes different disadvantaged sports tend uh, not to do so well in, simply because they don't apply or they don't own the land or whatever. So uh, that's always a challenge, uh, a challenge for them. Um, and I suppose what the department wants is to encourage the multi-purpose use of facilities at national, regional, and community levels by clubs, community and organisations, and NGBs as well. And, and you'll see a bit of a focus on that in terms of the sharing of facilities uh, section uh, of the application process. And I suppose the other program, the other objective, I suppose, is to assist NGBs and clubs with the purchase of equipment, uh, equipment as well. So the allocation criteria, I suppose, the fr uh, I suppose you know when you complete your application, it's first checked to ensure el eligibility. I suppose one of the things that you just need to bear in mind uh, and, and what the department do check is that the project is not is not something that was funded in the last 10 years. So if you're if you got funding towards your tennis courts eight years ago and you haven't maintained them and you need to replace them, uh, if it's if, if it's within the 10 years, you will not be eligible to apply for that particular project. So that's just something that you need to be aware of. And uh, uh, they're, they're, they're very strict on that. And a number of clubs have uh, had their applications turned down on the back of that. Um, I suppose one of the things that they changed last year, and you know, it's probably very welcome 
from a lot of a lot of clubs is that in the past, uh, if you got you know if you didn't dot an I or cross a T in your application, they would they would omit it and they, it would be invalid, and you would be very frustrated after putting in a lot of work. So, uh, so what they've done from last year and it's the same this year, if there's minor details that are omitted, uh, they will respond to you, to giving you a deadline to resubmit or correct correct the application or correct the, the error that's in there. So, so that's, I suppose, a good thing in one respect, but it also means that more and more people are going to have valid applications, which means there's more competition for, uh, for the funding that's there. So, um, and I suppose the other thing that they do is in terms of eligible applications are scored by officials against a number of criteria, you know, the likelihood of increasing participation and or improving performance. And that's a really big one for them. Uh, the level of socioeconomic disadvantage of the area, the technical merits of the project, sharing of facilities, the level of own funding that's available and the level of sports capital funding received in the past 10 years. So those six areas are really where, uh, really what they're looking for. And in terms of how they score uh, score uh, applications and uh, ultimately then it plays a part in in deciding on the allocations. Uh, but I suppose in deciding the final allocation of funding to projects within each county, the ministers have, you know, the minister has the final say and uh, they take regard to several factors, including the performance of each application during the assessment process. So just because you might have the, 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 the highest marks doesn't necessarily mean you get the highest amount of funding. There is a, I suppose, a, a weighting system that they use. And as I said, ultimately it is a little bit political as well. So the performance of each application, uh, ensuring a geographical spread of projects within each county. So obviously in, in some counties, you might have a, an urban and rural uh, sort of divide, I suppose, and, and they want to try and ensure a ge good geographical spread um, across across the county. And uh, they also want to ensure that, was it, that there's a spread of projects amongst different sports, okay? So in making allocations, priority will be given to organizations that charge modest annual membership fees. So if you're a club, and I don't think there's anybody here, uh, you charge a 5,000 euro entry fee, and it's, it's a thousand, uh, 500 euros or 2,000 euros a year annual sub. Um, I think uh, you, you know they will they will uh, exclude you, and uh, they may very or if they don't exclude you, they, they certainly may not award you any funding, and uh, uh, that's something as well. So obviously, you know if you don't if you don't charge once off entrance fees, and I got this clarified um, from the department, and uh, they're saying if because I do know there is a, a very small number of clubs that are in the lucky position that they're able to that they're able to charge once off entrance fees and uh, but if it's, if that entrance fee is below 500 euros you'll be fine um, and, and again I suppose the other one is that you're affiliated to the to the relevant national governing body of sport for example tennis Ireland so I suppose if you're a club that's on online here at the moment and, and you haven't or you're not affiliated to the organization Look, get in touch with Roger or myself, and and we will uh, we will arrange that, and uh, um, and I think that's I think that's important. The applicants uh, uh, you have to note you have to know that the funding is limited. So there's 40 million in the pot this year. Uh, probably around 30 million of it will go into the local uh, the local funding, and another 10 probably go into the regional funding, which I'll talk about in a second. And uh, it is a competitive process. I think there was about there was over a thousand. 300 i think applicants last last time around and i think the, the for the similar for a similar amount of funding i think there was about 120 million euros worth of applications that were in uh, there was i think there was about 34 35 million that was allocated in the uh, local funding and then about six or seven million in the regional so so it is competitive and it's it's important and tonight is really about trying to give you and give your club a little bit of an edge over everybody else okay so as i mentioned there's two categories of applications so there's local facilities and these are facilities that encourage participation with local communities such as local tennis clubs and, and, and for pretty much everybody here uh, there that, that, that this would be the uh, this would be the application that you would go with in terms of local facilities the maximum grant available from this particular scheme is 150,000 euros. Um, we do have a small number of regional facilities, and I suppose these are facilities that attract users across several counties, counties and conform to specification of, of ourselves and incorporate a range of sports facilities for training at international level. Um, so a couple of regional tennis centres, uh, local authority facilities, etc. The maximum grant available is 300,000 euros for, for those. And uh, I know you're all probably thinking, oh, I'd love to, why can't we become a regional centre, etc. Well, I think it's... Uh, Look, I think I think uh, certainly in the last round of the sports capital program, um, uh, there was there was one or two clubs that had applied in the re under the regional heading and they actually didn't get anything. Uh, all the grants that tennis got were in the were in the uh, the local facilities one. So so it's just something to bear in mind. 
Okay. So, um, as I said, there's 40 million euros allocated towards the 2020 round of uh, round of funding. They may go a little bit more than that, uh, depending on the number of applications that they get. The new round of funding opens on Friday uh, tomorrow, 11th of December, and the closing date, given us a good period of time, two months, uh, closing date is 5 p.m. Friday, 12th of February. So if you put your application in at two minutes past five on Friday, the 12th of February, it'll be rejected. They won't, you won't be able to do it. They're, they're very strict on, on the closing date. And uh, so just bear that in mind, make sure you're well prepared in advance. So what kind of things are funded? Obviously, you know, tennis court developments is, is what, what I'm going to focus on here in terms of, because that's our sports, you know, indoor tennis facilities, you know, the air domes, security fencing, ball stop netting, building and refurbishment of dressing room, showers and toilets, sports halls, gyms, non-personal sports equipment. Examples of that might be tennis nets, training equipment, umpires, chairs, that kind of stuff. Uh, they will... They will fund floodlights, uh, but they are very energy conscious and and uh, with a, I think the minister is from the Green Party, so uh, LEDs only. Modifications to sports facilities to improve access for people with disabilities and the same in terms of modifications for to reduce energy consumption. Uh, Non-personal sports equipment as well, such as gym equipment, lawnmowers, ride on mowers. I know a couple of clubs have looked at applying for that in terms of maintaining their courts or maintaining their grounds. Uh, other maintenance equipment and defib defibrillators and uh, uh, that kind of stuff. So they are pushing that whole area of equipment um, this year. Uh, now, you, you could always apply for equipment, but uh, this year they're just giving a little bit of extra focus. Uh, but they have reduced the limit um, uh, to uh, if you're applying for equipment that they've reduced that now down to 30,000 euros for equipment. So uh, they will consider equipment grants over 50,000. But again, that will only be in exceptional circumstances, for example, such as to it, maybe to a, a national government body or whatever. So, but generally for clubs, particularly in the local uh, applications, 30,000 euros would be the limit that would apply. Uh, they will fund portable storage containers or sheds up to 25 meters squared, and uh, that would be considered equipment, but they won't fund the larger, sorry, they, they will fund the larger module, modular buildings that require that require planning permission and our foundations. And there's a little bit more complex uh, complexity around that because you will require proof of title and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things I suppose that they that they are also conscious of as well is that the COVID is probably going to be with us with us uh, for a while longer yet even though we have a vaccine. So so they will fund uh, COVID-19 related works or equipment that is deemed essential to allow facilities to continue in use. And as I mentioned earlier on, projects will be deemed ineligible if funding provided uh, has been provided for that particular project in the last 10 years okay so what's not funded again as i said non-led lighting routine maintenance so if you need to uh do some routine maintenance on your courts and you have to bring in a guy to come in and maintain it they won't cover that they that that, that really is down to yourselves to do that they won't fund private commercial operations so the likes of your david lloyd's westwoods etc uh won't be eligible to apply so they, they really want to try to look at member owned not, not for profit uh not for profit clubs which i think the vast, vast majority of our clubs are. Uh, they won't fund operational costs. They won't fund viewing areas. So if you were saying, you know, your, your committee has got together and said, look, we'd love a lovely balcony looking out over the over the courts here. They won't fund that. That's They, they just won't do that. Uh, they won't fund car parks, roads or landscaping, bars, kitchens or offices. Uh, they won't fund projects where work has already commenced or where contracts have already been signed. That's really important. A couple of clubs, um, you know, across the sports have gotten caught on that one a few times where they started the work already before they had approval from the department or before they had before they've been given the funding and then they looked to claim it retrospectively and were refused so that's important um they they won't fund projects that are not sporting in nature it is the sports capital program after all so they want the facilities uh, they, they want the grants to go towards facilities that, are, that improve uh, participation increase participation or improve performance and that's why they won't do things like car parks or bars or kitchens and stuff um, they will take applications from schools, but only if it is jointly made with at least one sports club. Okay, and uh, and that's important. So, uh, so uh, a local school can't apply on their own. They're going to need to engage with a with a local sport, and uh, um, they will not fund the repayment of loans, and they won't fund the purchase of land or building. So, I think that's pretty pretty clear and pretty straightforward. Um, so, I suppose the online sports capital register. This is the this is the system that they use. It's it's the uh, a platform, a web-based platform that they use for people to uh, to to submit their applications. Uh, 
And uh, it's quite a clunky system. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. It's, it's the same one as it's been there previously. It is quite clunky if you've used it before. And uh, so there are some tips, uh, I suppose, that we can work with you on. And I suppose what I've moved on to there now, I suppose, is the home screen. So when you when you log into or log on to the sportscapitalprogram.ie website, uh, you'll see you'll see that there. And I suppose what you've got is you've, you've got a number of number of things here. So you'll see here a knowledge base. You'll have your login uh, details, which I'll talk about in a second. There's the register, which I'll talk about in a second. But there's some very useful guidance and useful links here. So there's the guide to the reg uh, guide to registration. So uh, if you're looking to register for the first time and to get your login, etc., there's a little guideline uh, to teach you how to do that. I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. There is the 2020 guide to making an application. So what I would do after this presentation, we'll, we'll send you out the presentation, but uh, also download and print off the guide, and uh, it'll give you a good, um, a really good uh, understanding of the kind of things the department are looking for after this. After this, they do have a, they do have a, I suppose, the scoring system and assessment procedures. I know it says 2018, but it's it's a very similar. I think it's the same as same as previously. And then there is a little bit about uh, if you're if you're applying for gym equipment, uh, they will insist on it being accessible. In other words, accessible to people with disabilities. So there's a little bit of information around that. And uh, I suppose then there's a, there's a there's another document there, a series of guides on how to get your how to get your grant paid. So you know if you're lucky enough to get an allocation, uh, that's that's uh, there's some further guidance there. All right. So we'll move on, I suppose, and as I mentioned earlier on, if your club hasn't previously applied, they, they must register with the, with the programme. So the deadline for this is 5 p.m. on Monday, 1st of February, 2021. Okay, so uh, I would say most of the clubs that are here have registered, registered in the past, but if you haven't, um, you, should, uh, you should do so. You only need to register once for, for, for this round of the programme and for any future rounds of the programme. Uh, what you will need to register is you'll need your tax registration number. And I suppose there's, there's a couple of... There's a couple of uh, types of tax registration number. If you're a, uh, you know, I suppose an unincorporated, an unincorporated entity, um, you know, voluntary non, not profit making, uh, you you download the form that's there, the, that document there for for voluntary non profit organisations, and then if you are a limited company, if your tennis club is a limited company, you'll need a TR2 form, and that'll give you your, uh, they'll give you your. Uh, um, your, your tax and the registration number once you complete that and send that back into revenue. But I'm sure, as I said, most of you have probably done that already. Okay. Uh, Roger, I see Colin Cunningham there. You might let him in if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then, uh, like, you can fill in the online registration form at, at, at sportscapitalprogram.ie, you know, when you click on register on the homepage, that, that one there. So so if you're registering, that's where you that's where you click. Okay, as I mentioned that. Uh, so we move on to now making making the application. So there's a couple of technical matters. You will have to upload some documentation quotes. Uh, there's a number of templates that you'll have to load up around planning permission, uh, document from your solicitor, et cetera. So um, the type of formats, or I suppose formats that they accept will be a PDF, GIFs, JPEGs, et cetera. So, so um, that's the kind of documentation that they that they will that they'll be able to that you'll be able to load up. The maximum file size for a single upload of document is five megabytes. So, if, that might be a little bit of a difficulty if you are, um, for example, if you have architects' drawings and you know maybe a maybe a whole portfolio of the architect has done for you for your project that might be bigger than five megabytes. So, uh, so it might be best to break that down into a, into three or four documents and upload those um, upload those to the to the system. Uh, one of the things that they do is make sure that you click save on a regular basis, all right? And if you're stuck in, getting your head down, stuck in, filling in the application form, you know, probably best to switch off your phone, spend a bit of time at it, and uh, as I said, click save on a regular basis. If the screen is inactive for five minutes, the portal will log you out, and all unsaved information will be lost. Now, that's happened to me on numerous occasions. I've been filling these in over the years, and I'm sure it's happened to a lot of you as well. And uh, so that's why I'm saying, like, you might get a phone call, and you could be on for a couple of minutes, and then you go back, and you've lost all the work that you've done. And uh, you, you will see as well that uh, in certain parts of the of the application process, you will have to uh, you have to put in some narrative, you know, around you know how will this facility summary of your project, for example. So one of the things that I do and I find I found very very useful is that I might type that out in a in a word document and and basically copy and paste it in once I'm happy with it, and uh, that sometimes helps a little bit as well. At least then if you if you if you if your screen is inactive. 
and you lose the screen, you don't lose your masterpiece of words that uh, um, along with that. So, so it's a good idea to do that separately and then copy and paste it into the, into the area. So hit the save button regularly. So listen, there are several, several questions that you'll need to answer in your application. And I suppose what I encourage you to do is to answer these very carefully because you will be marked on, you will be marked on these, uh, on your answers. And uh, you are also, I suppose, limited in terms of the number of characters that you can utilize. I know one of the, one of the larger areas is about 800 characters and it might sound like a lot, but it's not. And uh, so you need, to, you need to be very careful with your answers, consider them carefully, consider them, uh, make sure that they're concise. And again, that can be helped, I suppose, in terms of working on your narrative in a Word document beforehand. And then when you're happy with it, you can copy and paste it into, into this section. As I said, the better the answers and, and, and the more answers that you provide that are that are linked to what the department, or, or department officials are looking for, the more marks that you'll get. So really important to get inside the head of the department. What are they looking for? They don't really need to know that your club was founded in 1896 and uh, you had three Wimbledon, champ Wimbledon, Wimbledon champions back in 1903, uh, between 1903 and 1906. They don't need to know that. They want just concise information. What are you applying for? What is the benefit of this? And what is the, uh, you know, how will this increase participation, improve performance, et cetera? So you've, keep it concise. Consider what the department are looking for. So your answers will be carefully scrutinized. scrutinized. So therefore, it's important that you emphasize the merits of your project. Um, and, you know, one of the tips, as I said, is to use the guide, uh, use the guide uh, as you progress through the application, because there are, there is, there is useful information in that as well as you progress through it. Um, now, you'll also have to utilize some template documents, which can be downloaded from the system. I'll show you how to do that now. So when you're in, when you log in, you get your login details and you get the, you, you enter in and log in, you end up getting this dashboard here. So you'll see a number of different things here. So you can apply for a grant, apply for formal approval for existing grants, uh, edit or submit your draft uh, application, view past grant up, uh, grants and applications, view all previously submitted documents, et cetera, knowledge base, send a query directly to the department and, and view or edit your organization. Or contact details. So, so that's the the dashboard that's there. But over on the left hand side, you'll see this little area here, which I've headed off as documents. If you if you click on that, it'll bring you into this, and it'll it'll, up, it'll show you all the documents that you would have uploaded previously. But it will also have a little bit document templates uh, button at the top. And if you click on that, it'll bring you into the various uh, uh, templates that you need to download. And uh, you know, whether it's your loan offer letter, if that's if, if you need one, uh, planning permission not required, landlord to confirm access to site, template for solicitors to confirm title. You just click on download and it'll download for you, and then you can send it on and get get it completed as as required. Uh, and I suppose then, like I suppose the next thing then is really you know that you're you're getting in and you hit the apply for apply for a grant button, and uh, uh, then what you'll get then is you know, all your previous applications and. You'll just hit create application and then that'll bring you in then to the uh, to the screen to start the work so section one is around the project details so it's the project title uh, a little bit of a summary about the project uh, the location of it and project details including quotations and costs and i'll run through that uh, with you there now so you'll see this here now in terms of the first question that you have is project title and you have 50 characters minimum and really all you need to do and put into that is um tennis court construction or clubhouse or dress changing room rejuvenation or floodlight development you know that's all you need to put in there you don't need to be uh waxing lyrical about it it's just a, a very straight up uh, uh what is your project okay the next one then is really what they call your project summary and as i said you know they ask for a short uh summary of what you're applying for and uh, the summary should describe your project and how these new facilities will increase the number of active participants in your sport and what I would really urge you to outline is particularly how you can increase female participation, right? That's really important because that's a big, big thing for government at the moment. So if you're able to demonstrate that, and I think that's a strength that our sport has because we have a lot of female participants, that if you're able to show that the particular, particular project is going to increase participation uh, amongst, amongst women and amongst people with disabilities or people from disadvantaged backgrounds, et cetera, you will get, you will get top marks for that particular area, okay? And, um, you know, if you have if you if you have any targets or maybe, you know, you think that you're going to increase, you know, this, this facility will allow you to increase your membership by 10 percent. Put that in there. You know, so so it's important to take a little bit of time about your project summary and uh, and, and give it your full attention. Uh, 
Then you put in your facility address, air code, etc. And then they'll ask you, you know, for the, for the location of your facility. So there is going to be a, a national facilities database, which is which is underway at the moment. This this is going to help uh, identify facilities around the place. So if we look at this, you just zoom in, uh, zoom in on using the Google Maps function. That's that's there for you. Right down, and you plant the you plant the flag over your over your club. So this one here is Sutton Sutton Tennis Club. Uh, which looks pretty fine there. So uh, uh, that's that's that section done. Then you will be asked uh, for details about what your facility, what you're what you're applying for. And there's a little click down menu here, so it'll have you know tennis courts, football pitches, floodlights, etc. You just click on that and you put in what the cost of the facility is. Uh, you outline if you're applying. Some some clubs will end up applying for more than one thing, so they might apply for you know, clubhouse renovations, and that might be their number one priority. They might say, well, okay, well, we might guess, might get, might get, might get the full grant, but we'll also, but we also need a, a ride on mower. And uh, we might put that in as well, but we'll put that in as priority number two. Okay. So, uh, and then you, you basically have to upload your quotation documents. And I'll give you a little bit of information around the quotation documents in a second. So you, you'll give your, the document a name, you'll just type in the name, you'll type in, uh, you just click on whether it's a quotation tender or whether it's a, a, an estimate, uh, an estimate. Then you'll put in the supplier name, so Casey Courts or whoever it is, uh, the supplier quotation amount, and then you'll upload the document. So you click on browse, you go into your, whatever, into wherever you have that, uh, that document stored and upload it into, into this particular section here. And uh, then they'll ask you, is this application for a regional project? I think, as I said, for, for the vast majority of you, it'll be no. If you do, if you do say yes, you will have to get a letter from your NGV confirming that you are. So, uh, but but I think, as I said, for the vast majority of us, it'll be it'll be no there. Now and then you get into you get into uh, you hit save and next. But if you don't upload the document, it won't allow you to move on to the next screen. So what you can do is you can upload a dummy document. Okay, you can upload a dummy document in there, and then when you've got your quotation or when it comes in, um, you can replace that document um, very simply and put in the put in the uh, the new one. And then, uh, but what when, what you, what the uh, uploading a dummy document allows you to do allows you to go and move on to the next onto the next section. And you know, so you you could be the quotation might be the last thing that you're going to get, or maybe your your bank loan template might be the last thing that you're going to get. So. Uh, you want to complete the rest of the application. So you just upload the dummy document and then and then you can move on. So the quotation and estimates, I suppose at least one, you only need one. A lot of people think that you need three. Uh, you only need three if you're if you're looking to draw down or get approval for your for your project once you've once you've been given provisional allocation. So at least one professionally prepared quotation or pretender estimate must be included for each aspect of the work being applied for. So if you're building, say, courts from scratch and, and the courts obviously groundworks, courts, floodlights, fencing, right? So break that down into the different aspects of the works uh, that are there. And, you know, make sure that the quote that comes in is broken down that way as well, okay? Uh, it is, you know, whether that quote comes from a contractor or an estimate prepared by a technical supervisor. So the technical supervisor could be a quantity surveyor, it could be an architect or an engineer, and, and it needs to be on headed paper and, and uh, as well. Um, if it's just for equipment, you just need a quote, a quote from the retailer for the equipment to purchase. Now, another important thing is the quotation must be dated within three months of the application deadline. So if you got that quotation last June, that's out of date by the time February comes along. If you got it in October, by the time February comes along, it's going to be out of date. So what you want to do is if, if you, you know, get that now, go get that tomorrow, you know, or get it, get it in the next couple of weeks, upload it, and uh, that will be valid then. Now, the other thing that a couple of clubs have fallen down in the past is that the quotation might be made out to a different entity, say, for example. So it might be made out to Roger Garrity or Richard Fahey instead of, instead of uh, Term and Fagan Tennis Club or Sutton Tennis Club or whatever. So make sure that the quotation is made out to the applicant, which is the name of the tennis club. OK, um, and, and look, this is a little bit of a tip. OK, and um, uh, I think it's I think it's something that uh, you should really take on board. Well, obviously, you need to make sure that your own funding, your own local allocation or local funding that you provide to the project uh, and the grant must be enough to cover the complete project. So if you're looking to build, say, for example, a clubhouse and the clubhouse costs half a million euros and you've got uh, 50,000 euros 
and the maximum grant is 150,000 euros. That means you'll have 200,000 even if you get the maximum grant. You're still 300 grand short. They just they won't fund it. They want to make sure that the grant that you're applying for and your own funding must be enough to cover the complete project. Okay, so that's really important. The second thing then, I suppose, is you know you only need one pretender estimate or one uh, quotation that's there. Uh, try to get the quote a little higher than what it might eventually cost, even if this means you know, proposing a higher local contribution as part of the application, okay? Uh, the reason I say that is that you may get a higher allocation. When you, um, I suppose, when you uh, get your get your allocation, and if you're lucky enough to get your allocation and, and, and you get your three quotes and if it's a little bit a little bit lower, you, you don't have to give the full contribution that you've outlined in your, in your application. You only have to uh, um, uh, give a 5%, 5% uh, uh, local contribution. That's the that's that's how much the department will look for. Obviously, if if there's a shortfall, you'll have to you'll have to make make up that uh, short make up that shortfall uh, with a higher local contribution. But I think it's just a little tip for you. Uh, you know, get the quote. And I'm not saying double the quote, double the price. I'm talking about maybe 10%, 15% higher than there. Because look, it could be six months, it could be a year before you before you get this. And you know, inflation might might uh, increase the price. So make sure that uh, the quote, as I said, is, is slightly higher than what you probably will actually actually pay. Okay. Um, the other one then, I suppose, is really in drawings, plans, and specifications. Extra marks are available at assessment if drawings and plans are provided. Look, I suppose what the department are looking at is they want to see a you know professional, well thought through application process. And uh, uh, so if you have architects' drawings, if you have a uh, a little bit and again this is another way of actually getting more information beyond the 800 characters that are in the summary of the project you know put upload some additional information uh, about the project and there is a as i said there's a five megabyte, megabyte limit on uploading a single document but you can upload a number of those and uh, i think that's something to, to to bear in mind okay the, like again think about it the guys that are marking your assessments don't know anything more than likely don't know anything about your club they're sitting in an office down in Kerry uh they probably have never been to mayo or to whatever else to donegal or whatever and uh so you need to be able to demonstrate to them visually and and maybe through through uh the documentation and through your application that your club is is, is worth the investment okay um and as i said i said earlier on you can upload a dummy document if you want to move on and it can be deleted afterwards uh, for clubhouses, playing surface and floor line, you know, if you if you have technical specifications of what you're planning to install, uh, for example, if you if you were putting floodlights, put in the lighting design uh, that you have as well. Okay, so that's all uh, important. And uh, as I said, make sure that they're prepared by an appropriately qualified person or consultant. So the project details, they'll they'll ask you uh, a little bit more about um, the project as well. So break down the project as much as possible. As I said, remember what's funded, what's not funded. There's no point in putting in, you know, we're doing a nice bar or doing a balcony or whatever like that as part of your project that, that just won't go through. Make sure you have a quotation for each part. Prioritize as appropriate. And, and as I said, is the project match for each part? So that's all fairly straightforward. The second section then is really around membership details. Uh, they'll ask, is your organization affiliate, affiliated to the, to the NGB? Uh, if you're not, they'll ask you why. And uh, I don't think... Uh, um, you know, anyway, I will say nothing, but look, hopefully you all you all will be affiliated. You'll all be affiliated if you're not already if you're not already so. They'll ask is your organization run on a not for profit basis? They'll ask is your organization run and owned by members? Uh, they'll ask you about uh, are you open for new members? Uh, if your if your uh, club is closed for membership, if you're full, uh, they won't they won't fund they won't fund you because remember the program is about uh, how how can your project increase participation? Okay, so if your membership is full and on your website it says closed for membership, um, you you won't get funded because they do look at websites, believe it or not. Uh, does your organisation charge a once-off entrance fee? Uh, you know what's the annual sub? Give details of other fees such as discounts, family rates, etc. So so they're looking for a little bit more information. They do they will also look for the number of members that you have as well. So that's something that's something that's new this year uh, in this year's uh, in this year's program. And then you get save on that and move on to on to the next section which is around site management they'll ask you what facilities do you currently have who will use the facility how will you manage the facility and uh, you'll see that there in terms of what facilities do you have on, on uh, do you have on this or other sites at present the facility type again tennis courts clubhouse changing rooms etc number of them you know so if you have tennis courts here you have six of them just put in that and a little bit a little bit of detail you know just, just a one-liner uh, bullet point, you know, six tennis, six artificial grass tennis courts with floodlights, you know, 
uh, what sports or groups will use this facility. So local schools, maybe the local um, uh, St. Michael's or say, there's a local disability group. Um, if there are other local community community clubs that use the facility, um, you can put it in. You can put in. Um, uh, let's see what else. How do you manage? To, how do you plan to manage the proposed facility? So obviously, you know your facility might have a. If you're lucky enough, you might have a, a manager, or you might have a volunteer who, who looks after. You might have a caretaker, so on and so forth. Just very simple bullet points. Uh, very simple bullet points on that in that regard. Okay. How do you plan to encourage disadvantaged groups and people to use your proposed facility? Now, what I would say here in terms of disadvantaged groups, and you might think, you know, well, we're uh, like we're based in Ballymun here, in, in, in uh, or not far from Ballymun here. In, in, in uh, Tennis Ireland, uh, but you know, if you're living in a rural area, you might say, "Well, we're a long way from a from what you might consider disadvantaged groups." But disadvantaged groups could be in terms of people with disabilities. Uh, it could be people with. Uh, it could be it could be women. You put it in there as well in terms of how you encourage more women to get involved in the club. Uh, but I think the big one really will be around how do you encourage maybe perhaps people with disabilities. And you might say that well, we have the Enjoy Tennis program that's operating here, or we have the Parks Tennis program, which is a real focus on on getting people who might not ordinarily have an opportunity to play tennis as well. And so, so these are the kind of things that you could put in. You could put in there, even though you might be located within a, within a disadvantaged area. Uh, you would, uh, you, I'm sure, there are people within your community who are disadvantaged, and that uh, you might want to give them access to to the to the facility. You hit save, and then and you and you move on. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I have that bit there. Own funding. So section four, own funding. Okay, I, I suppose you, you need to show that you can complete the project. As I said. There's a, the department will look for a minimum of 5% of the project costs coming from, coming from, uh, from applying clubs. Uh, but there are more marks for a higher local contribution. Okay? So if you're putting in, I think it's 25% of a local contribution, you will get the highest marks that you can get. All right? So if you're only putting in, say, 15 or 10 or 15%, you'll get lower marks. If you're only putting in 5%, yeah, your, your application will be valid. Uh, but you'll only get the lowest amount of marks for that particular area. So this is potentially an area where where I think you can you can pick up some marks. Uh, as I said, the maximum grant is is 150,000 for local and 300 for regional. So you need to bear that in mind. You need to show some evidence that you have your own funding or your local contribution, and this can be shown by way of at least one statement from a financial institution. So this must be dated within three months of the date of application. So you might have a savings account or whatever. Uh, that uh, you you can you can get a statement from dated within three months of the date of application, and this will be used to, to verify the amount of local funding available. So, letters from benefactors if you're lucky enough to have them, or um, letters from a club saying, "Oh, don't worry about it, we're good for it," or future fundraising estimates are not acceptable. Okay, so they they want to see a bank statement or a credit union statement. Uh, if the level of funding includes a loan. Uh, your financial institution must fill in and stamp the template provided in the guidelines document. And uh, I'll, I'll show you that in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, one little tip here, make sure the statement that's on the net is, is the name of, is in the same name as the applicant. And be careful with online statements to make sure that the full name, full name is listed. I've come across situations where say on the last day they're looking to upload the statement and they, you know, they've got the money into their account or whatever. Like that. So they, they've, They've, uh, the, the, uh, the committee have all come together and, and loaned the club 3,000 euros each for the day to just to get the statement done. And then they, uh, they print off the statement and then they find out that on some uh, financial institutions, when you use the online statement, the name of the club is not there. So, so uh, it's important to do that. And the other thing as well is on the online statements as well, sometimes they don't show the full name. And we did have one... One tennis club two years ago that was was uh, declared invalid for, for that reason. And uh, I think their, whatever club it was, Croquet and Tennis Club, and I think it only had the name of the club, Croquet, and then that was it. There was nothing, no reference to Tennis Club, and, and the department refused it. So, so just make sure that if you're, if you're, if you're using an online statement, that uh, the name of the, uh, the name that you've applied in is also the name that's at the top of the statement, okay? So there you see, look, in terms of the savings institution names uh, at the top there, so Bank of Ireland, amount of savings available to go towards the project, you know, 
fifty thousand or whatever it's like that. If you're borrowing money, you know, Greystones Credit Union, uh, the amount of borrowings available to the project, X amount. So your total add up your total loan funding, the total project co project cost, if it's whatever, a million euros or a hundred thousand or whatever it is, and then uh, it'll automatically, you know calculate then how much you're applying for okay and then you'll go on to you download uh, actually they're, 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 they put in here the download the offer document template so if you're getting a loan from your bank uh, institution basically that's the document there so you'll have to get that your bank to put that on headed paper and uh, or stamped and uh, they fill that in so the name of the club the amount of the loan what the purpose of the loan you know towards this develop, whatever development uh, has the club any other outstanding loans from this financial institution what term is the proposed loan Etc. So, so there's a template that's there. Then you put in whatever the bank manager, please print his name, stamp it, put it on head of paper, etc. And then you can submit that via the platform. And uh, uh, it's very, very straightforward in terms of how you do that. The date, uh, you upload your statements then as well. And that's the way, that's the way it goes. All right. So moving on then to section five, uh, planning title and access. Uh, so you have to supply one of the following. So if you're applying for equipment, obviously you don't need planning permission and that's straightforward and that's a nice easy. But if you are planning for uh, applying for a capital project, there's a couple of things that you need to do. So you need either a copy of the planning permission for any, aspect, any aspects of the project that require planning permission. So if you're applying for floodlights, um, you know, you need to make sure that you have planning permission. If the floodlights are being replaced, so for example, if you're putting in LED lights, you may need to get, uh, you, you may need to make sure that the planning permission is current because I remember working in the FAI and there's one League of Ireland club, uh, which will remain nameless. They've had floodlights up for, you know, 25, 30 years. They went to make an application and then, you know, when they went to actually uh, uh, get get this document from the local authority. They, they subsequently found out that there was no planning permission for their floodlights, so they were goosed and couldn't apply, couldn't make the application, put themselves into a bit of trouble. So, so from that point of view, make sure that you have planning permission for you know if you have floodlights, firstly, and then second of all, if you're transferring them across into LED, just double check to make sure that you st you're still within that planning permission. And if you are, uh, great, and then just get the, the local authority or your technical supervisor. Uh, to complete the template where planning permission is not required. Okay, uh, if you if you have planning permission, or if you sorry if you have uh, planning permission, get a copy of that and uh, upload it. And if you have applied for planning permission, you might have the planning permission yet, but applying for it is just is, is enough to get you uh, a valid application. And uh, you will need to submit evidence of a planning reference number or acknowledgement of your application from the planning office within your local authority. And uh, it needs to be relevant to the, to the particular aspect of the project uh, that you're applying for. So this is the template that you need to complete when planning permission is not required. So again, it must be completed by a technical supervisor, arch architect, engineer, or your local authority planning department. So the name of the applicant, the address of the project, project detail, the site address, and then I certify the above name project uh, does not require planning permission signed and so on and so forth. And then you upload upload that. The next bit then, I suppose, which is, again, quite a complex bit, is uh, evidence of title to site. Now, for those of you who have, who have freehold, it should be relatively straightforward. For those of you who, who have a, a lease, there are specific requirements that you need. Uh, for those of you who don't have a lease, uh, for example, you might have a license or you might have... Uh, um, you just mightn't have anything. And I suppose that creates a couple of little challenges, a couple of little challenges for you, okay? So if you're applying for more than 50,000 euros in this, in this, uh, uh, in this pro round of the program, you will need the follow. Uh, you'll need your solicitor to complete the template confirming that you either own the site uh, for the proposed facility or that you hold it under a lease. And uh, uh, you need to, your solicitor will also need to tick the boxes that outlines whether the, the leasehold or freehold is registered with the property registration authority. If registration is pending, then a dealing number from the property registration authority must be included. Uh, if you have a lease, you must be able to demonstrate that there is at least 15 years remaining on the lease. Now, this is important for those of you who are maybe who are engaging with a local authority or engaging with a engaging with somebody who has uh, uh, given you some land or whatever else like that, and, and they might give you a 15-year lease. But remember, if you look at the previous bullet points, the property needs or the lease needs to be registered with the property registration authority. And I, off the top of my head, I think it's 21 years 
uh, the lease has to be in place before it can be registered. So your original lease might need to be 21 or maybe 25 years, but you should have at least 15 years remaining on the lease if you are, uh, you know, if you've had a lease uh, and, and, and it's been registered with the property registration authority previously. So, so if you've got 12 years remaining on your lease, you'll need to go back to your landlord or go back to the guy who owns the land and say, listen, can we get this uh, renewed? And, that, and as I said, that's why you're better off doing that now rather than waiting for the week before uh, the thing closes. Uh, the other thing that you're going to need to, to demonstrate and your solicitor will have to will have to uh, apply this is that the title can hold a charge. So uh, for those of you who might have had previous grants um, or are applying again, if you're if you're um, if the total amount of funding that you got goes above, I think it's 250,000 euros, uh, the minister will put a charge on the ground. All right. And that means that you have. Uh, uh, so if you decide to sell that land, you know, um, you know, two years time, and property prices go up again, and you, you you look to try and make a killing on it and move somewhere else. Uh, you will have to give uh, the non amortized value of that grant back to the minister. Okay, so so from that point of view, that's why they want they want the charge. And if you have any queries or doubt, uh, check directly with the department. You can give the department a call, or you can you can email them email them uh, directly as well, and they'll uh, they'll be able to assist you. So this is the document. Uh, this is the document that is uh, that your solicitor will have to fill in. So it must be printed off. All of the questions need to be answered. So the name of the property owner, what title does the above organisation have to the site, freehold, leasehold, number of years on, on uh, what was the original term of the lease, the number of years remaining on the lease. Uh, sorry about that. Um, you know, is the land uh, with the title registered in the land registration, property registration authority? Yes, no, etc. So, so there's a there's a template that's there as well. Now, if you don't have a lease or freehold, you, well, the maximum application that you can apply for is fifty thousand euros over five years. So, if you've got 50, 40, 000 euros two years ago, uh, there's you can only apply for ten thousand euros. So they will they will um, uh, they will check up on those kind of things. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, for an application less than 50,000, the following is required. So the owner of the land, um, you know, if it's a farmer or if it's a school or whatever, it's like that, they have to complete template, the template in Appendix 4, stating that the facility that is being a, a applied for a grant will not be taken out of sporting use for a minimum of five years. So that's something that you'll have to do. And that's that document. Uh, document there. I know it says 25,000, but that's actually last year's one it's a it's fifty thousand euros that's, uh, that's there so so you can see that one and that just has to be uploaded now the next one which is section six which is around sharing of facilities and you might recall in terms of one of the objectives was to uh that the department want to encourage the multi-use multi-use of uh of facilities by by different by different um, groups and community groups etc and uh now i suppose this is mandatory for schools for education training boards for third level uh colleges and and dios and trusts etc so they can't apply on their own. They have to share. Okay, uh, and I suppose one of the things that you can get is that uh, if you have to demonstrate that you're sharing your facility. So just putting down or getting a letter of support you used to, that you used to get years ago, or um, just telling them, yeah, well, we have the we have the local uh, ladies club come down and use our use our facility for bridge every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, you know that's not good enough. You won't get points for that. You won't get the marks for that. You will have to uh, provide a license agreement. Okay, they'll want to see a simple license agreement, which is signed by all parties, and as I said, letters of support are not accepted. And if you can put in three, show three license agreements, you will get maximum uh, maximum marks for that particular for that particular section. Um, the license agreements, then, I suppose, in terms of it's really important that uh, that you get. You're, you know that you're you know you might come across or you might have a template for a for a license agreement i think we might have one uh, but it's really important that you get this uh for your you know get get it reviewed by your by your respective solicitors and uh you know the department will check that the license agreement include the following information name and address of the facility proposed facility to be shared names of the groups that are party to the agreement including a signature responsibilities of each of the parties to the agreement, for example, around insurance, liability, maintenance, cleaning, et cetera, the details of any times when the facility uh, is available to each party and any access arrangements, the period for which the license is effective and uh, any limits on the purpose for which the facility can be used, joint management range, et cetera. So, so that's there. I see Mark, you've raised your hand there. You, you might have a question. Roger, can you unmute Mark, please, if you don't mind? Uh, yeah. Give me one sec.
be able to do it. Mark, yeah, you, so. you might be able to unmute yourself, I think, maybe, are you? Can you hear me, Sorry, right? that, was, that was an accident, sorry. No problem, you're getting jittery there, are you? <laughs> so, gotcha. Thank, um, God you're not the, thank God you're not in the White House. We'd all be nuked. Listen, uh, so we'll move on there. We'll move on. Uh, and I suppose we're getting to the end here now, I suppose, and there'll be plenty of time for questions in, in a second. So some common pitfalls. And, I, and again, these are just a few tips there as well. You know, around ownership and access, this is, this is where clubs can sometimes fall down. If you don't have 15 years remaining in your lease or it's not registered with a property registration authority. If you have a solicitor um, uh, who's filling in your filling in the form for you. Um, my view here would be, I, I, would, I would pay them to do it. Um, you know, you might have a solicitor in the club and you might get them, try and get them to do it for a favor. Uh, but I guarantee you, you know, there's no, there's no uh, solicitor who isn't busy. So it'll go down to the bottom of the pile and you can be sure that you won't get it until the last minute. And the chances are there might well be, a, there, there might well be a, an increased chance of an error in it. And uh, that might invalidate your application. So it's really important that you, you know, make sure that you get it to your solicitor early, make sure that all of the uh, requirements are there, that the, that the lease is registered or the freehold is registered and that you've, as I said, at least 15 years remaining on it. Because that's the kind of thing that'll take a bit of time to, to, to resolve. It'd be easy enough to get a quotation, but harder to get that, you know, a lease updated or whatever. Make sure the quotations are not dated beyond the three months. Make sure, you know, if you upload a dummy document, make sure you take that down and upload the real document. Uh, own funding. And, and like, I suppose one of the things you could, could do, a tip would be, you know, do it with some, do the application with somebody else. Get somebody else to have a look at it before for you before you uh, before you hit the send button. Make sure that uh, you have your own funding. Make sure that you upload the correct statements. And remember what I said about the um, the wording on, on, on online statements. Um, make sure you, as I said, correctly implement uh, fill out the templates. Um, uh, what else then? I don't know what, that, what I meant the way that now. No sharing of facilities. Oh yeah, make sure that you make sure that you, uh, uh, if you can outline that you share the facilities. Make sure that you have a lease uh, or sorry, a license with the with the user. Um, the application. Make sure that you start your application on time. A lot of clubs leave it to the last minute and end up uh, and end up uh, in a situation where uh, you know where they either make a mistake or, or or just don't get it finished on time. So make sure you start. Um, as early as possible. Now, I remember a couple of years back, the system crashed in the last hour of the uh, uh, before before the closing of the deadline, and uh, a lot of people really struggled to get their get their applications in. So, um, make sure you, you you get it done early and get it in on time. Uh, as I said before, make sure that you're not applying for something that was funded in the last ten years. So, uh, and save your work as you go. And, and as I said earlier on, there share the workload. I mean. Get somebody who's good in the IT. Get somebody who's, um, you know, can get somebody to go off and get do the solicitor piece. Get somebody else to go off and get the quotation. You know, make sure that it's not all on one person. Okay, and 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 the reason I say that is because I've seen situations here where, you know, an application is invalid or something hasn't been received or the application doesn't go in, and that particular person gets. Uh, uh, I suppose gets 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 a bit of the blame. So so it's important that you share share the workload and uh, but also share the blame if things don't go your way. Um, title and access. I spoke about that. Quotations, etc. And, and I spoke about the statements as well. So they're all they're all simple things. Submission basics. Start your application in good time. Study and use the guide. The guidance notes as you complete the application. Uh, get someone who has good IT skills to complete as well. Some people might struggle uploading documents and and, uh, and getting to getting to upload. Be clear about how your proposed project will increase participation or improve performance. You know, particularly at the start, that summary, the summary of your summary of your doc or summary of your project. You know, that's really really important uh, to get that right. Uh, and be realistic about the grant levels that you're that you're seeking. I suppose you know, and uh, uh, and make sure you have your local contribution in place and ensure that all project costs are covered. Um, let's see. I suppose one last thing is if you hit the finish and send button at the end of your application, uh, you know your application will be submitted. You won't be able to amend it afterwards. So that's really important that you make sure that you don't press that by accident. You hear that mark now? Uh, you're getting a bit jittery there. So I think uh, just don't don't hit that send don't hit that send button uh, at the end until you, until you're until you're sure you have everything everything in place. Uh, and I suppose this is this is the bits and pieces I suppose that are really important. Like getting the application in, I'd nearly break this down into a number of different stages. You know, getting all getting the application in is just the first part of that. The second part of this now is to 
is the political engagement. Um, and this is where I suppose there's a bit of work involved from a club perspective. And as I said, there's a bit of work from our perspective as well in terms of we're happy to, which we're happy to help you with. And it's really important that you lobby, lobby, lobby. I can't stress how important it is. No point going to uh, the TDs that are in opposition. They'll all tell you that they'll support your project. They'll all tell you that they'll, you know, when, when the applicate or when the allocations are announced that they that they helped get you the funding, they didn't. It's the guys who are in power are the ones that are making the, making the calls on it. So uh, at the moment, we've got Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, the Green Party, and uh, I think that's it. So so if you've, if you've got a local TD uh, from any of those parties, they're the ones to bring down. And uh, if you have a minister in your area, even better, make sure that they can come down as well. I think it's important that you, you know, let tennis are like we'll get a copy of the applications or not, a, not the applications, but we'll get a we'll get a list of the clubs that have applied and what they've applied for from the department. So so we'll get an idea of what you're applying for. But look, let us know. Let us know what you are proposing to build or whatever. Or if you need any advice. You know, just drop myself or drop the development team a, a line, and uh, we'll 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 help you wherever we can, wherever you can. And uh, but as I said, it's it's uh, when your application is submitted, invite your local government TD or your minister to your premises. As I said, make sure it's the ones in power. Invite me also as well. So I, I'll do my best to come down, particularly if it's if, if it's around uh, an event in your in your facility. Like I mean, over the in the last round, I must have gone to about I'd say about forty clubs between open days uh, around their open tournaments, finals day and all that kind of stuff. So make sure the facility is busy. In an ideal scenario, make sure that you have plenty of, uh, um, you know, a wide, a wide demographic of people that are there. For example, young people, older people, men, women, people with disabilities, you know, most TDs have never been to a tennis club or, you know, or don't know too much about tennis. There is a couple of them that play tennis. Our current minister, uh, or Minister of State, Jack Chambers, plays tennis. He's a member in Castle Knock and he's, uh, his family would have played tennis as well. So we're, we're lucky and I think we've got a big advantage there over other sports this time around. But, uh, but not too many others do. Uh, I've gotten Owen Murphy playing, but he's, uh, um, he's a little bit more time to play now this, this year. But, he's, um, but I think uh, as a, that was one of the things, not too many not too many of the TDs would know about tennis, would know about, you know, how, uh, how broad the level of participation is and, and so on. So really make sure the facility is busy. There's nothing worse than bringing a TD or minister down the place is empty. You know what I mean? Like he'll, that'll leave an impression with them to say, oh, there's nothing going on here. So try and build, a, build it around an event and uh, make sure that you invite the local media, utilize your own social media. Uh, the minister or TD will often come down with their with their private secretary or their press secretary or whatever else like that. So, you know, link in with them around their social media. Thank the politician afterwards by way of a letter for attending and reminding remind them of the need to support the club's application. And if you have drawings, make sure that they're there. Uh, make sure that, you know, the local media get a picture of yourself and the minister holding the drawing and, you know, get a, get the quote in from the minister that he'll do his best to try and fund it. Because if that goes into the local media, into local papers, he really has an obligation to do it. Not a lot of sports or not a lot of sports or not a lot of clubs do that. GA probably do it a little bit. Um, we, we've done it and, and that's how we've gone from about ninth or 10th in the list of clubs up to fourth over the last uh, two rounds of the programme. And it's a really important part. And as I said, if you invite me down as well, it gives me five minutes to talk to the minister about you know tennis in general and where we're at. Uh, but it also gives me gives me some some uh, time with the minister or the TD to talk about how you know what a what a you know a great job the club is doing here in the local community. And uh, so that's really important. And the other thing is what we do as well. And you won't see this, but we engage with the minister afterwards. So as we get closer to the to the period of time when they'll do the allocations. Um, in the last couple of rounds, I've gone and met with the minister, uh, met with his private secretary, and actually gone through gone through the list of of, uh, of clubs and saying, look, these we really need these to be done, and and it's those kind of things that uh, uh, that have helped us to you know to, to go up the to go up the I suppose the, the rankings in terms of the numbers of uh, the amount of money that we get, uh, the amount of allocations that we get, and then the level of allocation. I think we had the highest individual allocation in the last it was like in the last round we were probably second in the last round but we were we had the highest individual allocation or average allocation across uh, uh, across all the sports in the um, in the 2017 round so so it's uh, it really does work it really does work
I suppose where to go for more advice? Uh, well, obviously there's the, the website, sportscapbroken.e. They have a written guide. There's a YouTube video, they have a knowledge base, all that kind of stuff there. You can phone them directly. Uh, there's, there's phone numbers there as well. And, uh, but you can also email them at sportscapitalprograms at tcagsm.ie. Uh, so so that's, uh, um, that's pretty much it from my point of view. So I'm gonna stop the share at this moment. I'm, I'm hoping you're all still there when I come back and um, perhaps we have a few questions. So I see a few questions. Yep. So I'll probably go through those first, Raj, if that's, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, okay. The first one was in from, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the first one came in from Cahill, um from Navin. Uh, we've applied for a 50% grant for the SEAI for lead floodlights. Yeah. The, the SEP awards 90% grant. What advice would you give us? Should we reject an actual 50% grant from the SEAI? if we get it, in, in the hope of a potential 90% award from the SCP. Our last oh. grant allocation from the SCP was in 2017. Okay, and again, it's a matter of timing, I suppose. I'm not sure, like, I know the SEAI have opened up their uh, their process at the moment. I think they're, they're looking for application at the moment. I'd apply for that. I'd also apply to the sports capital as well, uh, as I said. And if you do get an allocation uh, for the floodlights in the sports capital program, um, what you can do is, you can use some of that, you know, some of that allocation if there's a shortfall with the SEAI. I'll come, I'll, I'll, I'll unmute you now in a second, Carl. And then, uh, but the other thing is you can look for a change of use of your sports capital grant as well. So I'll unmute you, Carl, just to make sure, because I know you probably had the uh, uh, question. Just give me one second. Um, I think I've asked you. Yeah, there you go. Can you yeah, hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, my question would be, um, yeah, if we get an allocation from the SCAI. Yes. Let's say possibly in January or February. Yeah, we won't get an answer from um, SEP till probably October. That's correct. So, can we actually apply for monies? Yeah, for some from two grant authorities for the same. Uh, you can. You can. You can. Yeah, like they. They. Uh, um, you can, and, and and people have done so in the past. And if there is some money left over, you can look for a re uh, allocation of that grant. OK, my understanding is that you can do that. Now, just double check with the just double check with the SEAI. But I do know of clubs in the past that have applied for both uh, as part of as part of that uh, project. But uh, my understanding. Well, it'll, be, it'll be with the SCP because, um, yeah, yeah. if we get an award of 50 percent of the SEI, SEAI, yeah, we should just take that. Yeah. And obviously we're still short 50 percent, let's say. Well, yeah. Um, and then when time comes and we get the same allocation or get an allocation from SCP. Yeah. Um, you're saying, yeah, we've got excess allocation. We can just re reassign. You're saying you can just get it reassigned. Yeah, you can get it reassigned for yeah. something else. Okay. Okay. So, Roger, another two, question there. Do you have a second one, Carl, or is that is that the two questions answered there? Is yeah, it? Well, the second one below, I think. Uh, let's see. Was you're saying any uh, documentation has to be within three months, even if you like, let's say the title, even if you have a valid one oh, from your last application. Yeah, I think that should be, I think that'd be okay. I don't recall seeing anything that has to be in the last three months. Um, but if you check the guidelines, uh, so the quotes, the quotes should be, but if you, in terms of your title document, uh, in terms of your title document, you just need to just double check that. I think it, it might require that in the last three months to get your solicitor to, to sign that in the last three months. I think it will. But I think the, uh, um, yeah, I think, any template that's there, you should just take it that it'll be in the last, you know, that it has to be um, um, signed in the last three months. Okay. Okay. And then there's one from Gemma. Then okay. if we miss the deadline, when will the next round of SCP be? It'll likely be, I, I don't, we don't have an exact date, but generally it's probably around every sort of 15 to 18 months. And, and that's, that's what they, that's what they look at again. Uh, it just depends. It depends on the economy. Depends on the minister and the department, etc. So you know they do. They, they generally will do one probably every, as I said, every fourteen to sixteen months. I'd say probably eighteen months. So so I would imagine uh, if I was to guess at a timeline. Uh, so closing days in February, probably be September. September at the earliest, I suppose, when they would announce the allocations, and then they'll probably do a new another round, maybe uh, January, February, whatever, 2022, let's say, something like that. Okay. And yeah. then Aidan has asked, is there a template for the license agreement? Yeah, we have we have a template. Um, we have a template, and look, I could send it out, but what I will say, and I'll put it on the I'll put it on the template, and uh, is that uh, really you should get your own legal advice. Don't take we won't take any. Uh, 
we won't take any, uh, how would you say, don't be coming back to us uh, crying if there's if there's a bit of an issue afterwards. You know, as I said, it is, it's a template. That's all it is. You will have your own circumstances. You'll have your own requirements. You'll have your own things. And you really should get uh, maybe a solicitor to have a, have a little look at that. If that's okay. All right. Okay. And then Louise is asking, what is the recommended percent of self-funding that you would suggest a club applying for? I, look, if you can afford 25%, I do the 25%. I think, uh, I think that's, that, that'll get you the largest uh, amount of marks. If you can do 30%, great. But the reality, the reality is like very few clubs get the full amount that they're looking for. You, know, you, do get a, you do get a couple, particularly in Dublin, they tend to get a little bit of a higher allocation simply because more, the way the, way the programme is done, so the 40 million will be split across uh, uh, the 26 counties and the larger the county in terms of population, the larger the amount of money that's going in there. Dublin has, even though it has a bigger population, it probably has a per capita, it probably has a smaller number of clubs because a lot of clubs don't own the land and don't own, you know, they might use football pitch in, in Phoenix Park or in St. Anne's Park or whatever. And uh, so you tend to find that they don't, they don't often apply. And, and that's why Dublin can seem like the, the allocations that are awarded to Dublin clubs can seem to be a little bit larger. So, um, but I, I would suggest that you, that you, uh, uh, put in 25 if you can do 30 percent put it in you know um, the, you know you will get the you will get the maximum maximum marks for that particular one and so, gary does that answer your question um which is similar, are there any benefits to having higher contributions which would make the grant funding more likely yeah so that that's it like so as i said as i said if you can if you can put in i think it's 25 percent that gets you if, if you can show that you can have a 25 percent local contribution that gives you the full marks okay for that particular particular area um the other one, if you received, if you apply for a resilience funding, come Civico, can we apply again? Yes, you can. There's no, uh, in terms of resilience funding, um, we, I think we had about 40 odd clubs that applied for that. And then there was another 33 clubs that got funding uh, via local sports partnerships around the country. So it was about, I think it was about 70, 75, 80 clubs that, um, that have either applied, the local sports partnerships have started giving out that funding. Uh, we're not quite ready yet. And, and the reason for that, we'll probably be ready, probably, it'll probably just be after Christmas now. The reason for that is Sport Ireland have come back. We haven't got the money from Sport Ireland yet. And I suppose they're, uh, they've changed the goalposts a little bit in terms of the level of due diligence that the NGB have to do in relation to uh, assessing the applications that came in. Uh, There's a little bit more work that we've got to do on that. So, uh, uh, but if you do, if you are lucky enough that you've gotten resilience funding, apply for and, and receive resilience funding, um, you can still apply for sports capital. No, no issue with that. Louise, okay. Um, next one. Mentioned the timeline for award. Uh, yeah, October. Yeah, I think October would be potentially be realistic. Um, it's usually about six months. Again, it just depends on. Uh, usually, the department officials would have everything done uh, probably after about four, four or five months, and then it really goes down to the minister. Then when, uh, when he sees the most opportune time uh, to um, to issue the issue the allocations uh, do you need planning permission before you submit your application or can you get it after the application you you at the very least if, you, if you're building a clubhouse or putting courts or lights or whatever you need to have at least applied for planning permission so the minimum that you have to do is apply for planning permission uh, the, you might you might get the the planning uh, afterwards or you might even be refused planning but the department um, will, when you get an allocation, um, they might not know that. But at the end of the day, it's, it is only a provisional allocation that you get. And you will have to submit that, you know, submit the planning, um, uh, the proof of planning when you go to draw down or start your project. So, so, uh, so what you get in, is, a, is a provisional allocation subject to, um, uh, subject to uh, ensuring that the planning is in place for that. Okay. Uh, next one is it definitely prudent to start the project before the grant application is announced? Absolutely, yeah. We have a grant for account must be spent and claimed before the end of twenty one. I hope we start this year. So, Aidan, I think yeah, they 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 definitely won't fund or won't give funding retrospectively. I, I think one of the things that you could do there, and if you want, I'll help you. I'm not sure what local authority it is, uh, but we can we can work with you maybe to touch base with the local authority and if you explain to them about the sports capital funding and all this kind of stuff they don't you know i think i think you'll get a fair i think you get a fair hearing and if you don't get a fair hearing from them 
as I said, uh, let me know or um, get onto your local get onto your local politicians and put the put the pressure on there, and they, they'll they'll make sure it goes through in the end. Okay, so um, but it is a difficulty. I understand that. We have another. We actually had one uh, club as well. I just got a call yesterday. I think about it, and, and uh, they're a brand new club. I think uh, I think they're on the line here now as well. So um, you know they have some funding. Uh, they, they, they've got a new lease on land and they're, they're moving and pretty much starting a new club. So I've outlined to them that with the funding that they have in place already, because they want to get up and running, that they, they're looking, they've planning permission for five courts. They want to start on the two so that they need to demonstrate in terms of in their summary of their application to say, look, we have two, two courts already uh, and we are applying for courts three, four and five. So you, you differentiate, you differentiate what you're, what you're applying for. And you might have a situation in a club where, say, for example, you've got, you've got five or six courts and, you know, within 10 years, two of those courts were, were replaced. Right. Uh, but the other four weren't. OK, so what you need to do is differentiate between the courts that have been funded in the last 10 years and the ones that aren't. So that's really important. OK, and what I would do there is I would check, uh, check with the department as well in that front. Like, like, don't be afraid to give them a call, give them, a, give them a drop them an email in that regard. OK, and uh, maybe, maybe get that, maybe get that on the record for them. But I have been told that if you differentiate, and I know there was one club uh, in the last round uh, that did that, they differentiate, differentiated between uh, the courts that were fu were funded by the sports capital program within the ten years, and then others that they had just funded themselves. So, so I think that's that's an important one. Okay. Um, uh, Colm Cunningham was looking to come in to just to talk because sure. it's probably too long to write what he wants to ask. Go ahead, Colm. Thanks, Roger. I just had a quick question about prioritising. You said that you can put multiple items in your application. Mm -hmm. And, and we're interested to to look at developing lights, but maybe to doing a, a wall, a practice wall as well. Yeah. I just wanted to know if, if there's a chance that you can weaken your overall application by adding multiple things. If, for example, for us, if the lights are much more important, should we just keep yeah. it simple and ask for the lights? Yeah, my, my view would be, yeah, probably, and, 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 and go with the lights. I think, uh, you know... No, it's, it's really a call for yourself, but for, if it was me, what I would do is I would just apply for the lights because you, you don't want to, again, you're looking at, you don't want to give them really an out. Even, look, even if you got, even if you only got 20 grand for your lights or, or 10 grand for your, you know, 10 grand of lights, now they won't just give you that. They'll either, they'll either give you nothing or they'll give you, they'll give you, you know, a, a half decent grant. And um, I think that if it was me, what I would just do is I'd apply for what my priority project is and, and, and leave it at that, to be honest. Thanks. There's another one there, Castle Bar, uh, Dan, uh, Dan uh, Rima. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah. So you got a dome a couple, a few years ago through the Sports Capital. Yeah, you did. Uh, just maybe, Dan, are you there? Maybe you come online if you don't mind. So you can just get the rest of that question. Dan, are you there? Uh, yeah. Hi, Richard. Sorry. I, I actually typed it in two different lines there because my, my battery died. So okay. the question is, um, very simple. We, we got a dome a few years ago, but we need we need repairs. Can we? In, do you want to get some new courts as well? Because our, our outside courts are in a terrible condition. Yeah, Can I, I know. I know the this, I know the story down there at Dan. So what I would suggest that you do, like if, like that dome, I think was within the last ten years, off the top of my head. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Yes. And no, you won't be able to. You won't be able to apply for repairs for that. Um, so what I would suggest that you do, like that'll have to be covered by the club. You know, the, the ongoing repairs or maintenance of that. But in terms of your courts, your courts are down more than 10 years, I believe. So yes. uh, what I would do is I would just, I would prioritize the outdoor courts because that's, you know, that, that'll be your best chance of getting funding. You won't get funded for, um, for repairs to your dome, unfortunately. Okay. No, no. Thank you very much. Thank you. No Sorry, Richard. Somebody mentioned Clan Credo there. Can we tell yes. them anything about Clan Credo? Yeah, there is. Yeah. So Clan Credo are, so basically as part of your, uh, if you're lucky enough to get an allocation and um, start your projects, approval to start your projects, what you will get is um, uh, you will have to pay out first before, uh, how would you say, claim the grant. Now, they're pretty quick in terms of the payments. So if you submit submit your, your the evidence that you've paid the contractor and so on and so forth and upload that, generally within about 10 days, they will, they will, they will send the money back to you. They're pretty good at that. And uh, assuming everything is in place. Um, but Clan Credo are, a, are what they call a social finance organization. So they're a bit like a credit union, except uh, they don't take deposits. They only give out money. So Clan Credo have started up a 10 million euro fund. 
and basically what they uh, what they will do is they'll provide bridging finance for clubs uh, through their project and they will also can also assist clubs in terms of term loans as well they are they're pretty good they're they're really really good i'd have to say now the experience that i've had with them across uh, in tennis and also when I was in football as well, have been really, really good. They're, as I said, they're a social finance organization. They won't look for personal guarantees like banks. Uh, you know, in fact, they'll fill in whatever forms for you. They come out and they'll meet you or they'll meet you over Zoom or whatever, and they'll they'll talk you through. Now, obviously, they want their money back. Uh, obviously, they'll charge. There's a bit of an interest rate there. Uh, that's there. It's probably similar enough to what the banks are, maybe even maybe even uh, slightly less than what the banks are the banks are offering. But uh, uh, well worth having a chat to. Um, if if uh, if you want to, and uh, so it's Clan Credo. You can get them at C, uh, Clan C L A N N C R E D O dot I E. And as I said, they have a ten million euro fund which they have just launched, uh, a loan fund which they've launched specifically around the sports capital program. And they do a lot of really really good work. Um, so 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 well worth having a chat to. They're they're a good reputable organisation. Sorry, Roger. Any other any more there? Did you get Joe Murray from Bishopstown? Uh, I don't think like. I did. Oh, I see. I see it here now. So, uh, license agreements. And like, was there, there was a mention of registration, Oscar. Is it just the club needs to register? Okay, really good point, Joe. Thanks for bringing that up. I, I, I meant to bring that up. So, if you have, um, right, you, you know the way you have to register on on Oscar, uh, Roger, register on the online sports capital thing at the start. Um, if you have a license agreement with, say, for example, a local school or a local uh, some other organisation. They will also need to register if they are not pre-registered on on the on the on the program. So that's really important that you do that. Okay. So if you're getting a license agreement, say from a local school or another local club that uses it or whatever, then they should register uh, register also. Okay. Next what one. about George Nish? If if you got courts and lights within the last ten years, but want to increase the number of courts with lights. Yeah, I think I think I've answered that. I suppose George, and uh, it's good to good to see you. Um, uh, my old club down trackside. So uh, if you've got courts and light, yeah. So I, yeah. So if you've got the funding, last as I mentioned earlier on, you just need to differentiate between the courts that that has received the funding, and if there's a couple of courts that haven't received funding in the past, you know that's what you're applying for. And I, and I think you need to demonstrate that by you might need to demonstrate that by. Uh, uh, you know, maybe an architect's drawing or a photograph or whatever else like that, so that you can clearly, clearly demonstrate to the guys down in down in uh, Kerry that this is what you're looking to do. And as I said, I know the courts and trackside, so you've got a, you've got uh, five or six very nice uh, artificial grass, and then there's a couple of the, the the tarmac ones which are in a in a need of repair. So I think from that point of view, you can you'll be able to demonstrate uh, demonstrate that to the department as clearly as you can. Okay. And can you see Gary's one after George yeah. is there? Okay, can you explain the process for drawing down the money? Okay, I could do, but I tell you, it is it is, look, it's probably for another workshop. And, and, and as I said, we will look at doing a workshop uh, for for when that comes on. But but in essence, uh, do you need to be able to fund 100% of the cost and claim the money afterwards? Yes, you do. And and but you can break it down into different stages. So when you're negotiating with your contractor, you might have a number of stage payments. So I, I know a lot of a lot of. Uh, Tennis court manufacturer contractors might say, right, uh, well, we want, you know, thirty percent up front when we when we sign sign the uh, uh, the agreement. Another thirty percent, uh, you know, when when the materials arrive on on site. Uh, another thirty percent when, you know, you know, at a particular stage of development, and then the last bit, I suppose, in terms of retention or whatever. So that's split down into three or four three or four stages so you could get the first invoice in you could pay that first part of that invoice then you can go make your claim the department will give you 95 percent of of that assuming you have that to the level of, of funding the job and then uh, that will allow you then to move on to the next on to the next uh, phase and then submit the next phase of of, of funding so that's uh, that's that one okay and then eileen is asking will stp formally extend the 2018 sports capital grant date from november 2021 yeah. due to covid delay i think they will i think like i think the key thing here is you need to you, you need to uh you'll need to contact the department okay and you will need to give them an update in terms of where you are with your project so if you say for example were delayed specifically because of covid listen they, there's no way they're going to pull that money on you right if uh um if there is uh you know a genuine reason for it they won't pull it in fact i haven't really come across them pulling it you know there's there's always a threat of that sunset clause or whatever but uh but if if, if uh, a club engages with them a 
club tells them, look, we're just short of a little bit of money. We're trying to fundraise. We're trying to get the last few bits and pieces together. Uh, they will, they will, they will accept that. They will accept that. Okay. And it, like the oh, just as I said, the last one. I think another one's after popping in there. Um, where are we? Fiona. Um, oh yeah, we got. Sorry, the. There's a few questions coming in. It's moving up. Uh, we got SCP funding in 2018 for court resourcing. Do you think it's worth applying for floodlighting funding this year? Or, yeah. or um, as we got a grant in 2018, yeah. should we just apply for some equipment funding? Look, I, I, I would always apply and I'd apply for what you need. And I think, um, you know, we had clubs applied in 2017. I know St. Anne's applied for a grant in 2017. So I think they got they got probably I think this, the highest the highest uh, allocation in in Waterford that year, and then they got another very high allocation the following year. And um, it really just depends on how many clubs apply, how much money is in the in the county, and to be honest with you, how much lobbying you did. Like we we worked very closely with St. Anne's on that, and we you know we worked closely uh, with the minister down there, and he look, just happened to use use the use the club for his how would you say constituency meetings and all this kind of stuff and you know they were lucky enough to get it so it, it you know my view is i would always apply every year and uh look there may well be years where you don't get the funding um but i think uh i think look as i said if you're not in you can't win so i would make sure that you do and uh you know do the, do the lobbying do the lobbying and uh, you know there's there, there are plenty of examples of clubs out there that have gotten uh, gotten funding a couple of years in a row. I know there are examples. I see Louise's next one, Clatarf, where they yeah. but I think it's uh, I think it's just something that I would I would be applying. Yes, you you lose marks if you have got funding in the past, but if you have uh, if your how would you say if your application is able to uh, pick up marks elsewhere to cover that, um, then that will increase your chances. And um, and as I said, look, it is a political it is a political process. I mean, I know they always say that it, that it really isn't. It's down to the marks and all that, but it is a political process, and you need to engage. And if you can engage better uh, than other clubs in your area or in your county, well, then I think you have a better chance. And I think it's the last one now, Rich. Is it Joe again from um, Bishopstown? Yep. You see that one? Yeah. Uh, sorry, no, I, haven't, I don't see our, it there. Our project is replacing our tennis courts, but we are going to also add paddle courts as part of the upgrade. Okay. Will this be part of a single application as we are not affiliated with, with Paddle uh, Ireland yet? Yeah, uh, to be to be honest with you, from a paddle point of view, uh, like Paddle is not a recognised uh, body, I suppose, from a, uh, from Sport Ireland at this moment in time. And um, uh, I think... It's probably it'd probably be difficult to get funding for the paddle courts uh, at this stage. I'm not saying you won't, uh, um, but I think in certainly in terms of from our point of view and in terms of from a lobbying point of view and all that kind of stuff, we would much rather see you go for the tennis courts. Now, obviously, it's up to yourself to do it, but I think you'll have a better chance getting the tennis court funding than you would have the paddle court funding. OK, let's see. Is there anything else there? I'm just going to scroll down. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you've clay courts in Tipperary. Uh, you bring clay in every five years. From uh, could the clay be applied for? That that would be seen as maintenance, I'm afraid, and uh, so I don't think you could, Patrice, unfortunately. Uh, but what you could apply for maybe is if you have a, I don't know if you have some uh, equipment or machinery or whatever else like that. That uh, uh, that could be um, that could be applied for in terms of helping you to maintain the maintain the court. So. Uh, unfortunately, they would look on that as they would look on that as a uh, as maintenance and, and, and that, you know similar to uh, a, a, you know an artificial grass court um, coming in and being maintained even if it is every couple of years. So unfortunately, not uh, trees. And then, is it a max of one hundred fifty thousand for a particular part of your master plan? If you already have received, support, can you apply for one hundred fifty? Yeah, look, you can apply for whatever you whatever amount you know up to one hundred fifty thousand euros, and. Um, um, so you could do, yeah, and, and I think, like as I said, don't be afraid to talk to the department um, about your project. So you could have, like, you just say for example, it might be a clubhouse development, or it might be uh, you're building five or six courts, and it might be three hundred thousand euros, and you might be looking at doing it over, over, uh, you know, doing a project over five or ten years or something like that. So the department, you know, are supportive of that kind of thing. And uh, so if phase one of your phase one of your project is what you're applying for now. Uh, you outlined that this is phase one of a of a you know of a of a you know five step master plan, and uh, you can outline that in your summary. And then when you are uploading 
the documents, the technical documents, you could upload a, a document which outlines what your master plan is and, and, and do that. Like again, as I said, the guys down in Kerry, they probably don't know your club. And uh, you know, so don't be afraid to upload uh, upload more information to them explaining, because obviously you've only 800 characters in the summary of your project. So might be an idea to might be an idea to utilize that particular section to upload a bit more information. So this there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, a lot of clubs have a master plan, a 10-year master plan. They can, they might have, might do it in phases. So it might be right, put the courts in first. Next time might be phase two, might be putting in lights with that. Phase three might be the dome. Phase four might be a clubhouse. So like that's that's uh, that's perfectly perfectly allowable. So I think we've got uh, I think we've gone through all the questions there. If anybody's any questions, has anybody got any questions there? If you want to raise your hand or whatever, if there's anything before we sign off. Um, I do appreciate that it's whatever just after half eight now so you, it's it's not easy staying on zoom for an hour and a half missing coronation street so larry larry you have a question there or no you do you know don't you sort of set up a round of applause larry um I'll, I'll unmute yourself there larry if, if you have a question no i think it was just a i think it was just a a clap hand so um I don't think there is anything there at the moment. Look, as I said to you, uh, I have all your email addresses, or I certainly have, if you've, if you've registered for today, uh, I've got your email address and I'll email you out the presentation. I'll email you out the, uh, the toolkit and I'll email you out a template, uh, the template license agreement. And, uh, but do bear in mind that the license agreement, you, you know, it is a template and you should get your own, uh, you should get your own one and um, get a check by your, check by your solicitor, okay? So, um, I don't want to be any. I don't want to be in any uh, court cases coming down, coming down the tracks. All right. So uh, look, w w without further ado, I suppose. Look, I'd like to thank Roger for uh, coming online. I think we have a couple of we have a couple of our board members online as well. I think David Splann is there, president of president of Leinster Tennis. I think was there earlier on, and uh, we have a few of our development team. Uh, Peter um, uh, Liz is there, I think, and uh, who else is there? Is Alwyn there as Our well? Aaron Alwyn. Aaron as well. So, uh, and Stephen Garvin up in Ulster. Yeah. So, uh, look, it's really important that you keep in touch with those guys. Uh, let them know what you're doing. If you have any questions around it, uh, keep in touch with me. Let me know how you're getting on. Uh, if you want me to come down and visit, I suppose, obviously, bearing in mind the restrictions, I'll make sure I get a vaccine beforehand. And uh, uh, I look forward to, to hearing about your projects. I look forward to being able to announce that we have. Uh, done very well in, in the sports capital program later on and um, look I think we'll do a few more of these workshops I think they're quite useful maybe we, we might look at doing something around floodlighting or around uh, maybe clay courts because that's another thing actually that's one of the things I, I wanted to talk to you about if you if you do if you are looking at replacing or putting in new courts you know do have a little think about clay courts it is it is uh, the technology has moved on a lot in the last couple of years and we've it is it is uh, catching on a bit I know uh, a number of clubs have put in put in clay courts and they're very happy with them um Fitzwilliam have put them in, uh, Sutton have put them in, Carrick Mines have put uh, one in and they're very happy with them. They're going to put a couple more in, I think. So uh, it is something that is uh, uh, growing a bit like years ago when we all had the tarmac courts and, and everybody uh, started moving to artificial grass. I think over the next couple of years, you know, we will see more and more clay courts and that will be good for our, for our uh, up and coming junior players. And it's, you know, good for, uh, I suppose good for good for our game as well to have a, a variety of courts here as well. So, um, but look, I'd like to wish you a happy Christmas, and um, please feel free to email me afterwards if you have any any other questions. I think you, you probably all have my email address, or, or certainly get it through get it through uh, our development team. Okay, thanks very much, guys. Richard. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye.